Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by the NIH-funded uh, Mobile Data to Knowledge Center based at the University of Memphis. Uh, my name is Vivek Shetty, and I'm the MD2K's uh, training code director. Uh, today's webinar, Improving Behavioral Measurements from Mobile Devices, is, prevented by, is presented by Dr. Stephen Intelli. Uh, he used to be the technology di director of the House Research Consortium at MIT, and now is a professor in the College of Computer and Information Science at Northeastern University. Uh, Stephen has been one of the early movers in the space of uh, mobile health and has, in a very brief uh, period of time, established himself as a thought leader. He's doing some very exciting work involving technologies for measuring and motivating health-related behaviors, supporting healthy aging and well-being in the house setting, as well as longitudinal measurement of health behaviors for research. Stephen, welcome. Thank you again for uh, sharing uh, and, uh, your uh, research with us, and I turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you, Vivek, uh, and thank you for the invitation to, to present the webinar. I'm going to talk about improving behavioral measurements from mobile devices, and uh, if I can make sure my slide will advance on my computer. Hold on a sec. <laughs> And um, generally, my research group works in the area of human-computer interaction, sensors and machine learning, and behavioral science. Kind of right in the middle of that space is where I think there are a lot of opportunities. And we're trying to build computational models that in real time can measure behavior states and contexts of people to build just-in-time adaptive health interventions. And ultimately, we want to validate those in the real world. So this is the type of thing we do with mobile and ubiquitous technologies. And I want to talk a little bit today about just some observations that we've had in doing this type of work and how it's led to a little bit of a shift in how we think about where we need to go in the future. So the takeaway message from this talk is that traditional scientific instruments for measuring behavior, states, and context of people are poor. We generally know that, and that's why there's an interest in using smartphones and smartwatches and wearable sensors to provide new sensor data, and then to take the digital breadcrumbs that they leave behind to infer behavior, states, and context more reliably. But a takeaway from this talk is that although that passive measurement is ideal, and a lot of us are trying to achieve that, to validate and improve these emerging measures may require new self-report methods. And in particular, context-sensitive and what I'll call micro-interaction-based ecological momentary assessment. So I'll get into what that is. But before I do, just sort of jumping up to the 20,000-foot level, uh, we really do need new measurement tools to accelerate scientific discovery. And if you look at other areas of science, every time there's a new measurement tool, there's a, a big advance in science. So at the massive scale, we have telescopes that have really evolved over time from relatively simple mechanisms to the Hubble Space Telescope, and then ultimately even to, to um, the ability to look, you know, m millions and billions of, of uh, billions of miles away. And every time that happens, there's there's new scientific advance. And at the micro scale, with microscopes, you essentially see the same thing happening. That over time, the measurement tools have improved, and every, every time they do, you get a huge advance. And so now, this is sort of DNA data visually represented. We can go at an incredible level of detail and um, change the science. But at the behavioral scale, where are we at? Uh, it's really a barrier, because if you go to a typical NIH grant review meeting on research related to health behavior, there's essentially an elephant in the room. And that the elephant is that all of the results are often based upon, for the most part, paper, uh, retrospective survey types of instruments where they're gathering this data. And we know that they're noisy, but in some cases we often forget um, how poor they are. In fact, it's not uncommon for investigators of studies to not even necessarily have taken their own surveys. The surveys sort of take on a life of their own. And when you go back and you actually take them, you're often surprised at, at how uncomfortable they make you feel because you know as you take them that they're not really accurately capturing what your life is about. And this is important because if you think about exposure and disease, we know that uh, from things like familial, uh, familial and twin studies that uh, 
in the case of heart disease, mortality, and cancer deaths, roughly 90% cannot be explained by genes. And so even though there's a lot of excitement about genetic work, we really need to understand these environmental factors more. And it's specifically what's often called the exposome, the things your body is exposed to. And a, a, a good number of those things, like diet and drugs and stress and behavior and lifestyle, are things that we need to be able to measure better. These tools are actually quite poor at measuring. So things like diet, um, what's eaten, but also when and how, your physical activity and sedentary behavior, risky behaviors, medication adherence, social context and socialization, assessment of pain, stress and stressors, and effective state. So if we really wanna have a comprehensive view of somebody's exposome and how it relates to health, we really need to measure many of these things, maybe all of these things, essentially simultaneously for, for individuals. But at the behavioral scale, um, we don't have great tools to do that. So what might we do? We could automatically detect patterns of behavior by computer from those digital breadcrumbs, and we could simultaneously measure across health research silos to obtain a more holistic view of behavior. So if you look today, sleep researchers tend to study sleep and physical activity researchers study physical activity and nutritionists study nutrition. And there's a little bit of crossover, but not nearly as much as there really should be. And we want that crossover so we can find the unexpected relationships between behavior and health outcomes. And then ultimately develop computation-based models of behavior and behavior change. So if we can figure out a way to reduce this measurement noise, we can really advance science and advance the types of models that we have. And I think the need for this is, is essentially undisputed if you actually look, look at actual data on measurement. An example from physical activity is from the influential NHANES study. And in that case, roughly 45% of US adults meet the physical activity guidelines based on self-report, but based on an objective what would be called a quote unquote objective measure of an accelerometer, only 5% meet the guidelines. So at a, at, no matter what, we have a problem because there's a big difference between the self-report and, and the non-self-report measurement. And we don't know exactly which one is, is most correct, but there's a, an assumption often that the, that the sensing-based passive measurement might actually be more accurate. So if we have better measures, we can ask better questions. And in particular, if we have better temporally dense measures, we can really ask better questions. So in the case of physical activity, if we can know continuously what somebody's doing, their posture and their ambulation, we could ask questions like, are short bouts of activity as protective against disease as continuous long bouts of activity? And unless we have really good measurement tools, we, we can't even ask those questions. So we're trying to, as much as we can in terms of measurement, we wanna think long-term. And there's really two motivations for measurement. There's scientific inquiry with better tools for scientists, and we definitely need those. But there's a, a second category, which is building effective interventions. And there we want to measure changes in behavior and state, and we want to use measurement to intervene with just-in-time support for health and wellness that's tailored to a person's behavior and state. And so in that second category, it really requires a somewhat different type of measurement, longer term, maybe less invasive than what scientific inquiry might, um, and definitely more temporal density, uh, if you wanna understand somebody's decision-making processes, for example. So with these digital models of behavior, the question is, can we incorporate real-time behavior state and context and ultimately build probabilistic models of current behavior, next likely behavior, maybe even things like person's receptivity to, be, to information or decision-making and cognitive reserve and, and habits and habit formation. So how, how do we get there? So I, I use this um, example often, it's data from myself where I had a sensor on my wrist and my ankle and I went through and I manually labeled uh, what I was doing over a whole number of days. And uh, some things that I do, we can detect automatically like ambulation, but many of these things that are listed here, we're working towards being able to really reliably detect them. But what I want you to notice from this is that if I look on a particular day, uh, you'll see certain types of activities where uh, just in a typical work day for me, I'm kind of walking around campus and doing things. Here at the beginning of a day, I get up in the morning and I walk my dog and sort of get ready for work. And then I'm in a variety of meetings sort of going between point and point. And you can see in the, in the data where that's on my ankle, the lower graph, 
that when I'm walking quite a bit, you get these sort of big spikes. But the interesting thing for me is that if you really dive into the data on the top one where my arm is, my arm sensor, you can see the hitting snooze there every 15 minutes is a little blip, right? Now you would never know what that was, except for if I go forward in time, you tend to start to see some of the same pattern. So I'll go forward a couple days here. Um, and then you'll see here, there's a same pattern of little blips in the morning about six o'clock, which is me hitting the snooze button. And then you see me walking the dog. And so what happens is there's this uh, pattern because most people are have sort of habits over uh, many days where once you can start to see what I'm doing in one day and you have labels for it, you may start to be able to infer what I'm doing in the next set of days. And so we're trying to get to the point where we can get a computer to do something like what you would be able to do if you studied my data here. You'd start to figure out what my patterns are and put labels to those patterns. And we wanna do that not just for physical activity, but for social interaction or location, um, things that, that other people are doing in their everyday life. And then think about how could that information, if we had a really detailed model of somebody's behavior, change the type of research questions and interventions that we create. So what my group does is we do a lot of work in physical activity as one behavior of interest and we do lab validation experiments where we put a whole variety of sensors on people in the lab and then what we call simulated free living where they're out on our campus riding bikes and walking around and sort of doing stuff. And we have graduate students follow them around and label what they do and then we try to figure out, can we detect what they're up to from those sensors? And this is the type of work that a, a lot of people do. And this is an example of one of those types of studies. And I don't wanna go into this in a, in a lot of detail other than to say, in this case, we had 51 activities. Um, if, we, if we combine them all together, a random guess would be about 2%. And if we have, uh, no information under subject independent, no information from that individual, about 50% of the time, the algorithm would know which of those 51 activities they were doing. If you collapse those activities down, so you're just looking at say, postures and ambulation with no intensity. So now you have eight activities, guessing would be 12%. Um, then about 92% of the time, you know which of those eight activities somebody's doing. And for postures, you can do quite well. Now, this is with using more than one sensor on the body. Um, we've also doing work where we take a single sensor, like one at the wrist or one at the ankle, which is more typical of what health researchers do today. And then we try to determine, can we, can we figure out what they're doing? And in particular, we're interested in the wrist. And that's because in physical activity studies and in influential studies like the NHANES study in the US or the UK Biobank study in the UK, where they've, they've collected data now from um, 18,000 or uh, 50,000 or more people wearing accelerometers on their wrist. Um, now there's a question about how do you interpret that data? And so we've been doing work trying to figure out, can we get rid of the gesturing essentially that happens on a wrist and figure out is somebody ambulating or cycling or sedentary or doing some other type of activity? And so what you see in this confusion matrix, if you look on the diagonal of the wrist part of the matrix here, um, you can see that uh, we do reasonably well, although there's some con confusion on activities. If we have an ankle-based sensor, we can do much better because the sensor is essentially providing less ambiguous information about what, what somebody is up to. What we're trying to get to is to be able to recognize things like the 51 activities, um, but doing it from a smaller set of sensors and more complex locations like a sensor on the wrist. We've also looked at other types of behaviors like detecting smoking, for instance. Um, and the thing about this, as well as most of the other behaviors is that if you have a relatively simple example, like what is shown here, um, hopefully it shows up as an actual video over blue jeans. Um, it's somebody kind of standing still and smoking. And if you look at the accelerometer data, you get a pretty clear pattern in that case, and you can identify where the puffs are, and an algorithm does a reasonable job of finding those puffs. Um, but that's the easy case um, when there's no other activities. If you work on what I would consider to be more realistic data, um, where you have people actually eating and smoking and moving around, the problem becomes much harder. And this is true 
pretty much of all of the domains. I think a lot of the lab-based studies that we see that are published in the engineering literature, when you try to apply those algorithms to the real world cases, they often don't work as well as they did in the lab. And one of the reasons is because even when you're trying hard in a lab situation to get realistic data, it's probably gonna be oversimplified to, to some extent. We've also been doing work on trying to detect sleep and sleep quality through a combination of passive sensing, in this case, a sensor on the wrist worn during sleep um, and a phone that's by your bedside that's monitoring audio and then active sensing or self-report that's tied into that real-time sensing. So in this case, uh, for a study, we built a system that would detect sleep disturbances uh, based on the motion data and the audio data. And then in the morning, essentially, right when you get up, it would ask you about those sleep disturbances and try to get additional contextual information about them. So here's a combination of the passive sensing and the self-report. And really a big point I wanna to make today is that the self-report, we oftentimes, especially within engineering, the goal always seems to be, let's do it passively. And there's an assumption often with medical researchers that it has to be something that there's not much interaction with but we're going to need a, a fair amount of self-report for certain types of activities. For some listed here, like eating, there are people trying to do it automatically. But for other things like perceived exertion or for pain, it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to do that automatically, at least any time in the near future. We're going to need self-report. And the question then becomes, how do we get that? But there's a, a question for those of us trying to do this passive recognition as well, which is how do we validate the algorithms that we actually built? And that's really what led me to what I'll talk about for the rest of the webinar here, which is we're trying to build these algorithms that can detect these types of labels that are shown here. But these labels are changing very quickly. And especially if I start talking about things like postures or uh, things that aren't physical activities, but how I'm feeling about something, that can change Quite, quite quickly, quite dramatically. And now if I've built an algorithm to try to, to try to detect that, and I wanna test it outside of a very controlled lab setting, I run into a problem, which is I need really high quality labeled data at a very high temporal density. And that is in large part what has led our group to um, start really more seriously trying to explore how can we, how can we deal with the self-report that we need. And it's made complex because everybody's different your day is gonna look very different than mine. And so we're almost certainly going to need training data from individuals to make these systems work really well. And, and your activities and moods and states are changing very quickly. So we've done a bit of work where we use EMA in research studies. EMA is ecological momentary assessment or essentially a fancy name for having a phone beep at you and ask you a question, right? Or a multiple choice series of questions. And it ha it's valuable because it has ecological validity, it's the question is asked in the real world, prompted several times a day on a mobile phone, and that reduces recall biases. And it can also help you explain missing sensor data that you might be collecting passively. So typical EMA surveys that we've used in some of our studies are shown here. It's just a multiple choice question asking about how you're feeling or uh, what you've been doing recently. The limitations of EMA are that you have interruption burden. It's really the Achilles heel of the technique. You oftentimes in a, in a research study run by health researchers, you'll have relatively long question sets with frequent questioning uh, where um, uh, people have to obtain access to the device. So they have to pull it out of a bag or a pocket and the prompt is usually audio and disrupts what they're doing. So there's a fair amount of interruption burden. And, the, the, that results in a high perceived burden and a lower study comp, com, compliance. If you've ever participated in one of these types of studies, you know that the EMA can get very annoying. So the challenge is how do we reduce interruption burden, but still achieve a high temporal density in EMA so we can get that self-report data that we want. And one thing you can think about is using context sensitive sampling where there's some amount of sensing that goes on in this case from a Bluetooth inhaler that when pressed sends a message to the phone and then five minutes later, the phone would ask about that asthma event. And so that means you're not sampling randomly, you're sampling a little bit more strategically and maybe you can reduce the amount of sampling that you do. You can also measure the motion of the mobile phone and see if the phone has not been moving or moving and then ask questions based on that. 
or you can collect data passively. In this case, it was for a pilot study where we collect passive data throughout the day on the phone. And then at the end of the day, teenagers would go in and essentially the uh, label automatically segmented blocks of data. So in this case, the phone was not moving that much and then moving for a while and then not moving. And in this case, the teen at the end of the day, if an algorithm can't figure it out, could essentially click on that uh, little question mark and then indicate what it is they were actually doing. And what you get is a temporally dense 24 hours a day labeling of what that person was doing. So this is sensor assisted semi-automated self-report. But again, the CMA challenge is how do we reduce the interruption burden and get this high temporal density in EMA? And the, an idea we're exploring is the use of what we call micro interactions. So at a glance, micro interactions. And the, the way you, I want you to think about this is if you're in the middle of a conversation and you look at your watch to get the time and you go back to your conversation, you can sort of do that in one flow. What we'd like to know is can we create a measurement technique that's going to be as easy as that so that we can get a high temporal density using the self-report and specifically doing that using uh, smart watches as our platform. So a micro interaction is something that's been defined in the community as taking about two seconds to complete a really simple uh, motion or movement looking at something that does not distract us from our activities that the length of time is really important and why would we want to do that on a smartwatch? Well, we get the digital display, the touchscreen input, the sensing features, and it's in really instantly accessible, very quickly accessible, and you can have reliable tactile prompts. So we call this micro EMA, micro interaction ecological momentary assessment. And the short story is that in regular EMA, we'll call that mobile EMA, you're going to interrupt less and ask more each time. You might have a whole series of questions and you might ask them maybe once every two hours, something like that. Versus micro EMA, where we're gonna interrupt a lot more, um, but ask a lot less. We're only in fact gonna ask one question at a time and it's gonna be a very simple one. There's a little bit of prior work in looking at watch-based EMA, uh, this idea that maybe we can make EMA better by putting it on a watch. Uh, and I've um, listed some of, the, some of the papers here, everything from looking at uh, filling out surveys when you unlock your lock screen to taking somewhat typical surveys and just putting them on a watch-based computer and even looking at things like EMA on a watch versus Google Glass and a phone. Um, but there's been nothing that really specifically looks at com compliance of micro EMA versus uh, standard EMA and trying to see how can we do that over a relatively long period of time of several weeks. So we ran a pilot study to try to look at this. Our goal was uh, to see if we have a new, can we come up with a new behavior measurement technique, which would be micro EMA. And the, the, to get there, we would need to say that we have validity of some sort of measurement survey. And, but before we do that, we have to say that we're gonna get study compliance because if we don't get compliance, we won't get validity. Uh, now, the trick is the current scope of where we're at with this work is really in looking at the compliance, which is a necessary condition. And we're just starting to look at validity because validity is domain specific. So here today I'm talking about compliance. So the survey that we used for our pilot study, just as an example, is the PANAS. And we use this because we've used it in prior studies with mobile phone EMA. It's asking you about how excited, nervous, upset, stressed, or alert you are right now with a five question answer set. And uh, we added an additional physical activity question to the end of that. So we have a standard EMA survey implemented on the phone for this. And what we wanna look at is EMA versus micro EMA. So on the mobile EMA, we had six questions in a prompt and the questions were asked roughly once every two hours. So a we have a question set. On micro EMA, we have only one question at a time with essentially a yes, no, or sort of answer type. So very simple and co cognitively simple. The scheduling is that in mobile EMA, what we have is a bunch of questions all asked uh, 
once within a two hour period. So here the circles are representing a five answer question. In micro EMA, we're asking simpler three answer questions, but many times per hour. In fact, the micro EMA interruption is about eight times um, as much as the EMA interruption. So most of the time people's initial reaction to this is, wow, that's gonna be really annoying um, being interrupted that frequently. So then, we don't have just the original prompt, we have a prompt and reprompt. If in case people don't hear the original prompt, the, the typically in EMA you would reprompt and give them a chance. So if you get a prompt and there's no answer, in the mobile EMA five minutes later, there's a reprompt. And in EMA, there would be a prompt and five minutes later there would be a reprompt. So those are similar. In our experimental design, we have the mobile EMA, again, interrupt less, ask more versus the micro EMA, interrupt more, ask less. We had, uh, our participants were broken into two groups, EMA and micro EMA, um, standard phone versus micro EMA on a smartwatch. They ran a study for four weeks where they were getting prompted at these high rates. And we looked at compliance, completion, response latency, and perceived burden, and I'll define those in a second. Our hypotheses were that for compliance uh, with answering questions, that the micro EMA compliance would be higher than the EMA compliance. And that's where, in the case of compliance, we're considering all the data loss. So if the phone is powered off, then that's considered a data loss. In hypothesis two, we looked at what we call completion. So we also said micro EMA completion, we think will be higher than EMA completion. And here data loss is not considered. So we include only the delivered prompts. So if somebody turns off their phone, then they're not actually getting the prompt. So we're not counting it against them if they don't answer the prompt. So here are the, the definitions of compliance versus completion. And so compliance is the question sets answered versus those scheduled. And completion is the question sets answered versus those delivered. And the compliance rates therefore are always at least greater than or equal to the actual compliance. And it's important to measure both of these things because researchers using AMA actually often don't they often report what we're calling it completion as compliance. And so sometimes people can turn off the phone for a good chunk of the study, and yet they can still end up in a paper, it sounds like somebody had high compliance because when they got prompts, they answered them, but a lot of the time they had actually turned off the technology so they don't necessarily get the prompts. So it's important that both of these be considered. Our third hypothesis was that the micro EMA response rate to first prompts would be greater than the response rates for uh, EMA to the first prompts. So if you are less hesitant to answer, you're more likely to respond the first time you get prompted versus kind of waiting and saying, I can't do it right now, I'll do it the next time. And so that's the questions answered on the first prompt over the questions delivered. And the last hypothesis was on perceived burden that micro EMA perceived burden would be less than the EMA perceived burden. And that's despite having eight times more interruptions in the micro EMA than the EMA. And the reason that we think this is because of the, the cognitive, the simplicity and the cognitive simplicity of answering the questions. Our hypothesis is essentially that people will remember in self-report the sort of worst case scenarios that they experienced when they're thinking, when they hear that prompt and they're thinking, am I going to respond right now? If you do a lot of this on yourself, as my, as my research group does, what you come to learn is that you, you're, you're always thinking about the worst case scenarios. So in micro AMA, we've guaranteed that the worst case scenario is a micro interaction. And that's why we believe that people may be more likely to respond. So our participants in the pilot study, we had 33 people uh, and they were broken roughly into half having mobile EMA and micro EMA. Um, these were college students for the pilot study for the most part. And our procedures were on day one, they installed the app. Uh, the micro EMA condition participants were loaned out a Moto 360 watch. So at, at the time we did this, very few people had watches. And, uh, and we also, the watches as those who program them know are very difficult to uh, get, it's difficult to get them to behave exactly as you want, specifically with prompting. And so we needed a certain amount of control to make sure that we knew we were, what data we were getting was actually accurate. 
on uh, each week of the study, they participated in an online perceived burden survey. And on the, at the end of the study, they filled out an experience questionnaire. And the only compensation that they got was they were able to use the watch for four days at the end of the study, both groups, um, just for fun, however they wanted to. So we did not pay them to answer questions as is done in most uh, health research studies. So our results for this part one of the pilot study, you can see here, uh, our compliance completion and first prompt rates all essentially show that micro EMA uh, is, is being uh, answered more often on the first prompt and uh, people are more both compliant and um, uh, compliance and completion are both higher. Uh, and so there is a certain amount of maintenance that has to happen with a smartwatch, uh, keeping it charged and all that. And so in both cases, uh, people did well. There are two outliers here that were thrown out, but even with those outliers in, the results still stand. Um, results on the second part of the first part of this pilot study, uh, the micro EMA participants were 1.25 times more likely to respond to a scheduled prompt, 1.35 more times likely to respond to a delivered prompt, and 1.65 times more likely to respond to a first delivered prompt. Here you can see their self-reported perceived burden over four weeks. And you can see the micro interaction um, interruption burden uh, is uh, re maintaining relatively, staying relatively steady and the micro EMA um, distraction uh, isn't, isn't too bad. Um, you can see that the relative to the regular EMA, micro EMA, again, despite eight times more actual interruptions, uh, does reasonably well. And here's the compliance and completion over the whole four week period. And you can see there's a bit more of an effect in the standard EMA uh, in terms of a, a trend towards dropping than there is in the uh, micro EMA. So the preliminary conclusions from this part of the pilot study was that despite eight times more interruption, the watch based micro EMA had a higher response rate and study compliance than mobile EMA. And despite interruption rates as high as eight times per hour, the watch micro EMA was perceived as more tolerable than the mobile EMA. The question that we didn't address here initially was, is the effect due to the micro interactions or just the smart watch? And so we, wa we wanted to think about that as well. Uh, there's some prior work on the usage of watches versus phones. And it's definitely the case because a watch is on your wrist, the access time is faster and so you can sort of get in and out of using it very quickly, whereas a phone uh, tends to have more prolonged interactions, still pretty short some of the time. But if you think about it, sometimes it's pretty hard to get access to your phone depending on where it is uh, and how far, uh, how close it is to you. And there was also some work on device novelty. So it could be the case that we just got better performance on the watch because the watch was a novel device. And there's one study out there that said that people who used EMA got higher compliance when they were loaned a mobile phone because that was somehow the device was more novel. But that was a short little study for just two days. And there were no studies on, on uh, smart watches uh, that we were aware of. So we thought it was important to examine the effects of the smartwatch novelty on compliance as well. So <clears throat> in this case, we then said, well, let's look at what happens if we have regular EMA on a watch, right? So we'll call that watch EMA. So we had phone EMA, and then here um, you have watch EMA, and it's pretty much the same question, and then there's a little bit of scrolling so that you can see all the answers because of the small screen on the watch. So that would be what a question would look like. And you would select an answer and then it would go on to the next question in that question set. And so if you think about watch EMA, the, in, the amount of interruption that you have with phone EMA is, is low because you're clustering questions all together, but the device access time might be higher. With watch micro EMA, the amount of interruption you have is very high, but the device access time might be very low because it's on your wrist. With watch EMA, you have a low device access time and a, a low amount of interruption because on the watch, you're clustering all the questions together. The response burden though, um, in the case of phone EMA, you have the high device access time and possibly a higher response burden with watch 
e EMA, you may still have a high response burden, whereas with watch micro EMA, that might be a lower response burden. So with watch EMA, the prompt scheduling is essentially just like it is in the EMA on the phone, and then watch micro EMA was as it was bef as same as before, and then with micro EMA interruptions, you've got eight times as many as the both a watch and the phone EMA. So essentially, what we did in the second part of this is just look and say, if we take something that's traditionally done on the phone and we move it to the watch, did we get all that power from just putting it on the watch? Or did we get on that, that power from something in the nature of making it a micro interaction versus kind of a standard EMA type of question? So here again, this was all, all the, we're comparing against this, the same situation, but now on the watch EMA, they're having a prompt and reprompt five minutes later. So here, the experimental design was our original experiment and then added on with additional participants who did watch EMA for four weeks. And then we looked at the compliance completion, latency and, and burden as well. So we added additional 10 participants here, again, college students um, to the study. And the study procedures were uh, identical as well. And again, the only compensation that anybody got was the ability to uh, try to use the watch however they wanted to for four days at the end of the study. It's typical within EMA studies in health research that you're compensating people uh, financially or in some other, some other way, usually financially. And um, oftentimes that compensation is tied into their compliance or completion rates. Here, we don't have that. So if we look at the, the result, combining all the results together, including the new uh, watch EMA data, you can see that the watch EMA and the phone EMA are sort of clustering together and the watch micro EMA is um, somewhat uh, separate in terms of compliance completion and the first response prompt rates. And so it appears that just taking a traditional EMA survey and putting it on the watch isn't really solving the problem of compliance completion and first response rates. So what we found was no significant difference between the watch EMA and the phone EMA compliance, no significant difference between the watch EMA and the phone e, um, uh, EMA, uh, should say, completion. <laughs> um, and in terms of response latency, no significant difference between watch EMA and phone EMA first prompt response rate. Uh, but watch EMA participants are 1.38 times more likely to respond to a scheduled prompt than watch uh, watch EMA, and watch micro EMA participants are 1.19 times more likely to respond to a deliver prompt than watch EMA, and watch micro EMA participants are 1.22 times more likely to respond to a first deliver prompt than watch EMA. So on the whole, we're getting better compliance and completion first response rates from the watch micro EMA, uh, and you can see that in terms of increases in response rates as well, so sort of similar type of pattern. Here's a summary of the response rate trends. Uh, it's a little bit of a, of a um, cluttered diagram, um, but the watch micro EMA uh, is tending to do pretty well, given that you're talking about having people getting interrupted six or more times per hour for a four week period. So what do we think we learned from this? Um, the novelty of a smartwatch and its easy access alone does not appear to be the reason that in the micro EMA pilot study, we, we see this effect. Um, we think that's just putting things on a watch is not sufficient to dramatically improve EMA compliance and reduce the burden. The micro interactions appear to be the necessary component to, to make this actually work. So let's say that this holds up in future studies, what would we do with micro EMA? Well, one use is distributed assessment and time. So we could take standard kind of watch EMA surveys or phone EMA surveys and just basically spread out the same questions in time. Now, whether you can do this depends on the nature of the type of questions you do. Um, but if we do that and we ultimately are just coming up with a composite score, you might get actually a higher compliance, less missing values and less recall bias by using micro EMA. You might also measure a single construct with uh, a single item, 
using micro EMA to get a temporal density that would otherwise not be possible. So you could do something uh, where you're asking essentially the same question, sort of true or false, and how you're feeling at any given period in time, get a very high temporal density, high compliance, low burden, and capture variability that you otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't get. Um, and, and that you could do that either with the same question or a construct that has multiple single items that are unrelated, sort of spreading them out over time. A third use would be to mark the occurrence of events that you care about. So that might be, do you feel pain right now? Yes or no. Are you eating right now? Yes or no. And then you're going to get high compliance and very high temporal density measures that would otherwise be very difficult to get especially for something like pain where there, we have no way to passively measure that. And I think the most exciting future area and the thing that got us into this in the first place is by combining the sensing and the micro EMA. So the context sensitive micro EMA. And in particular, I think those of us doing machine learning work really need this type of technique ultimately to validate our activity and state recognition. So if I have passive sensing coming off of a wrist-based smartwatch and I want to use motion plus heart rate plus location to detect what somebody is doing, I want real-time, and I have real-time detection of that, uh, I want to detect something like a label walking to work, then if my real-time detector detects that and then I ask a micro EMA question, what the pilot study would suggest is we may be able to get away with asking these at a very high sort of a, a surprisingly high temporal density. And then that information could be fed back immediately to the real-time detection algorithm to improve the recognition. A different example, also using watch, might be using uh, a device that had galvanic skin response, for example, and, and could measure heart rate variability. And then you might ask a question like, are you nervous right now, yes or no? Very simple question, cognitively easy to answer, uh, and therefore appropriate for a micro interaction, and then that might be used to improve the recognition. So if I can ask this question at six to eight times per hour and not drive my research su subjects absolutely crazy, which the pilot study seems to suggest may be viable, then it may give me new opportunities to really figure out how do I make these algorithms that work in the laboratory, but maybe have a hard, don't seem to work as well in real life. How do I make them work in real life and customize those to, to individuals in real time. So the takeaway message of the talk is that traditional scientific instruments for measuring behavior states and context of people are poor uh, and smartphones, smartwatches and other wearable sensors provide us with this new sensor data. We wanna take those digital breadcrumbs and use algorithms to passively infer behavior states and context as much as we can. But when we're trying to create this passive measurement, and although that might be ideal, to validate and improve these emerging dig digital measures is very likely to require new self-report methods. And in particular, the use of context-sensitive and micro-interaction-based ecological momentary assessment. Without that, it's, it's hard for me to see anyway after doing this type of activity recognition work for many years, it's hard for me to see how we really get to the point where my mobile device has this accurate and temporally dense and sophisticated view of what I'm up to throughout the day. And I think without that, it's going to be very hard to achieve the type of just-in-time interventions that many of us working in this area are interested in creating. Most of the time, if you just have a very simple passive measure, let's say like steps, um, things that commercial devices like Fitbits have, you, you have some information about what somebody's up to, but to really create the type of interventions that are powerful, that change behavior and allow for sustained behavior change, it's likely going to require a better understanding of what somebody's habits and patterns are, not just in that moment or for the last hour, but really how what they're doing now relates to what they typically do over a typical week or a typical month. And I think building those types of models is going to be very difficult to do without a temporally dense self-report type of mechanism like micro EMA. So I wanna thank uh, my collaborators on the work that I've described here and graduate students and um, um, some other researchers that we worked with on the, particularly on the micro EMA project.
Uh, I want to put in a plug at, for our personal health informatics PhD program at Northeastern University, and we're also hiring faculty uh, at this time. And with that, I'll uh, give thanks to the NIH, which supported some aspects of some of the projects I mentioned, Google Glass Research Award, and our pilot study participants, who in total tolerated 24,480 interruptions in the course of the micro EMA pilot study. And with that, I'll uh, conclude. Stephen, thank you. That that was another terrific uh, presentation. Uh, very fascinating work you're doing with uh, uh, micro EMAs. Blends in so nicely with the micro randomized studies that uh, Susan's group is working on. So let me, yes. at this point, uh, turn it over to the people who have signed on. Uh, just uh, just remember to unmute yourself as you ask your questions. Uh, and uh, Stephen is there to answer any questions. Very, I will begin. Uh, Stephen, thank you again. This was this was very, very nice uh, uh, to hear both your work and your perspective. So one quick question is uh, <clears throat> various models that you have developed uh, for assessment of activity and sleep from wrist-worn sensors. Are those models and code available for others to use? If so, from where? Uh, well, whenever we publish a paper, we put the data online and usually the, the code online. So if, uh, for the most part, if you go to my website, then there's, or go to my group's website, which is mhealthgroup.org, and then there's a, under research, there's a data, uh, I think it's a data link. And from there, once the paper's published, we're trying to always put the data online and, and the code online. Although I say the code is always research code, so it's not um, not necessarily easy to use, I would say. But um, we're trying to make things of it, trying to make the code available. Oh, that is so nice of you. That is so nice of you. Uh, I'll wait for others to work. I, I mean, I'll, I'll hold off my questions and give others a chance. Steve, Stephen Vivek, I I, I was curious. So. Are you contextualizing your micro EMAs with uh, any kind of geospatial data? Um, we, in the studies that we we do with regular EMA, we collect locate we collect location data. In some cases, we're using it, mm. uh, but with micro EMA, so far we haven't done anything specifically with the location, other than any any time we run these studies, uh, if we have or can get IRB approval, we, we, like I think many other groups, we try to collect whatever information we can. Um, so clearly location could be one context sensitive uh, factor that would drive what types of questions that you ask, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and it would, where the micro EMA concept would become most powerful is as the model that you have in the computer becomes more sophisticated then you can become much more strategic in terms of whether or not you ask a question. So if I have the opportunity to ask a lot of questions and get very temporally dense information, if I can figure out that I don't need to ask the most of these questions, I can, only, I can focus on the information that's essentially the most uncertain. And so location might factor into that in some way. But I, I think the problem is that this is, as, ever, as, as you all, everybody who works on this type of stuff knows, it's it's easy to talk about making something like location work and making it valuable information, but it's hard to actually do it because the, the data gets pretty noisy and you need databases that go along with that data oftentimes to use it the way people would like to use it. Sometimes those databases are not available. And just because you know somebody's location doesn't necessarily make that many problems that much easier. So in some cases, you know, if somebody's at a gym, if you can figure out they're at the gym, then certainly that would impact the probability that they're exercising. But it's not as simple as saying, well, if they're not at the gym, they're not exercising, right? Um, so I think the challenge here is in getting all these different types of data, fusing it, and then doing that in real time and then building up these models and somehow proving that the models are really accurate outside of the lab setting. And I, I'll say, you know, our group is, that's where we want to be, but we're not there yet. Um, just running a study looking at smartwatches and the compliance rates, I can tell you that we found uh, 
uh, there, there are many complexities with getting the watches to behave the way that you want them to, and it's a moving target. Uh, and if you need to know precisely that a question is prompted at a certain time and you need to know for sure whether or not somebody saw it and answered it, it sounds like it would be easy to do, but it's not. Hmm. Great. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'll leave it to the audience, John. Uh, Hello, hello, Stephen. This is uh, Nabil. How are you doing? Hi. Uh, thank you. This is uh, very interesting. I um, I had one quick question because you know uh, th this notion of micro EMAs is really interesting, and and with this thought about just asking you know that one single question or that one simple question, uh, if you, if you can talk about you know how you come about constructing that right because when we're thinking about um, you know, what's nice about the regular EMAs is we can ask so many different types of questions, right? So when we go back after the study, we can potentially build several models that try to infer, you know, uh, or predict or detect any one of these uh, different constructs, right, uh, based on these questions. But now when we're limited to one question, um, coming up with a design for how to ask that question seems to be important. And so, for example, uh, right now, when, when you mentioned, are you nervous now, right? Um, and, and this goes back to labeling your data as well. When you're saying, I'm, are you stressed now, or were you, you know, were you stressed the last minute, or were you stressed the last hour? Or were you stressed, you know, from now, you know, since the last time mm -hmm. we asked you, just to identify these kind of sort of start and end times um, uh, of these constructs seems to be really important. So, so I wonder when it comes to how you construct the question, yeah. is there a sort of methodology that you go about? Not yet. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think uh, that's where, so at the beginning of that micro AMA section, I, I said that you, you need to have compliance is essentially a necessary condition to make this technique work, and then you have to focus on validity. And the one of the first questions that most medical researchers will ask about this type of uh, approach is, is, is they're always validity-related questions. So I want to know these things. How do I do what you're saying? How do I pose a question to get at what I want? And if, it's, if I'm limited to single questions at a time that are very cognitively simple with kind of a single tap answer, how in the world would I ever do that? And I think for some of the types of things that are asked now in EMA studies, the, there won't be an easy way to, to do that directly. Though I think what the future is, but it's, it's up to us to really prove that this is something that, that is ultimately useful for science. I think the future is that you're, rather than saying that you're asking kind of all the questions each time you're doing the survey and you're limited to those set of questions. I, I think of it more as you're gradually building up a probabilistic model of somebody's behavior. And so that I don't have to ask the same question kind of over and over and over again, or the same set of questions. I, I ask some set of questions and then I become confident that I understand what's going on. And then I switch to a different set of questions. And I'm doing that over a much longer period of time. And, and so I see it as trying to build up this very rich model of somebody's patterns of behavior that where this technique might be able to really provide some value. Uh, and we have to figure out how to really prove that that's the case. And I think one of the challenging things with this is that the minute that you start talking about validity, your domain, you're, you're kicked into a specific domain. And that that's a little bit tricky because to show that you have validity, you need a gold standard to compare against. And, and so we're, we have some things kind of in, in the fire right now where we're trying to, to do that, but it's, it's not a straightforward thing to do, I would say. Now, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I'll also say though that in all of the EMA studies that I've done so far, what always happens is that the researchers who are, because uh, oftentimes I'm collaborating with groups where my group, we deploy our software uh, customize our software for an EMA study. So we're working with an external collaborator and they're coming at it often with certain scientific questions that they want to get answered. And what happens every single time is that 
they come up with a list of questions that's way too long, way too burdensome. <laughs> um, and then there are a bunch of re meetings with the whole research team where we all agree that it's going to be way too burdensome. And so they cut it back. And then what's normally happening is I'm saying it's still way too burdensome, we need to cut it back more. And they're saying we absolutely can't because these are the scientific questions we're interested in. Then we build the, uh, we build the, the actual um, uh, software and the surveys and we deploy it as pilot testing. And then the research team immediately realizes that these questions are too long and burdensome. And then even though they didn't want to, they're forced to further cut them back and start making more compromises. And so what you tend to end up with is the most burdensome set of questions <laughs> that the research team thinks they can possibly get away with based on what limited pilot testing they were able to do. And I just don't think that that ultimately is sort of the best approach. I mean, maybe it's better than all other alternatives, but uh, these are, I think the standard EMA survey that's used in health is quite quite burdensome on the participants and ultimately that also is going to affect the validity of the information that they're getting. So I'm not I'm not saying that that type of thing would go away, it's just that I think using the micro EMA particularly with underlying computational models of behavior that are gradually built up over time, maybe that's an alternative approach that may provide value to the scientific community. Um, it may not allow addressing all types of questions, but maybe we can address some things that we just can't address at all today. So maybe it's a comparison of apples, not apples to apples, but apples to oranges. Makes sense. Hi. Makes sense. Hi, hello. Uh, hello. That's, thank you very much. This is Maria Pimento from Brazil. And I, uh, thank you for your talk and everybody for organizing this. Um, with respect to, to your these studies you reported, um, I was wondering if, uh, for for one, if uh, when you compare the the two, the, when you actually present the, the, the all this set, this big set of questions on the watch, um, do, when you did that, did you do any study just comparing how sort of a cumbersome it was as far as the platform is concerned? I mean, so in one kind of. A, uh, way would be kind of fair to present the, the questions that way because they were actually designed for the smartwatches. And sorry. And the other quick question is: um, Did you consider or did you do any study uh, in combining both the phone and the watch? Say uh, when you have um, some conditions that you have observed, depending on the questions, you actually say. Uh, integrate with a, a longer question or a more elaborate questions in the watch. So the kind of having the two platforms working together. And thank you very much. Yeah, um, well, on the second one, no, we haven't, we haven't done that. I can see in certain types of studies, maybe having a hybrid approach, maybe that would be useful. But my caution would be, uh, I said that I th my, my hunch is that people assess whether or not they're going to answer the prompt based on the worst case scenario that they think they might encounter. And and I, I, I think the hybrid approach might suffer from that, but I can see certain situations where that, that could be helpful depending on the study. Uh, to get at whether or not it the interface on the watch in some way has an effect, we, I mean, we tried to, as much as we could, get the same questions onto the watch in the easiest way possible and from a user interface point of view. If you're dealing with the watches, you have a screen real estate problem. <laughs> you, you, there's not much to work with. And so that means if you're trying to get a question onto that, that's a really long complex question, you're gonna have trouble. We were dealing with relatively simple uh, questions, relatively short answers, and only five answers in the comparison. And so we think that the watch interface itself isn't really the, the, the barrier um, in terms of answering the questions on the watch. The, the, our assumption is that it's, it's simply the length of time that it takes to, to answer. Um, in, a, in the micro interaction questions, you really can be in the midst of doing something else, answer the question and keep going on with what you're doing. That's the only way that somebody could tolerate six to eight interruptions an hour and somehow say that that was better than, uh, than having just one interruption every two hours, which is what happens on the, on the, the phone. Um, but it also, it's also what happens in the watch EMA case. So that's one interruption every two hours, 
but it requires you to answer all the question set, the six six questions each time. So I, we believe that there's something fundamentally different about the micro interaction. The challenge that it brings is that it forces anybody who wants to gather information to think about gathering it in a little bit of a different way. And that gets back to the validity type of question. But I think for those who do activity recognition, um, who are trying to validate that their algorithms work, once you get beyond the lab setting, and you, you, this, this issue of where does your labeled data come from becomes really critical. And there's been a lot of work in trying to use front-facing video cameras, and, and we do stuff where we follow people around, but all of that is, um, isn't really scalable, and a, a technique like micro-interaction for that would be potentially more scalable. And more, even more important than that, if ultimately these algorithms have to be tailored to the individual, which I think in many cases they will have to be to some extent, then the idea of doing that tailoring through micro-interaction uh, may be the way, that, the way that we can make that tailoring sustainable because these algorithms, what they want, they want people to be answering questions over and over and over again. They want lots of examples of answers of questions, of labels, and that's the type of thing that the micro-interaction approach, if you do it well, maybe that would allow that to happen. And again, that's kind of what motivated us to go in this in this direction in the first place. Stephen. Well, thank you very much. 